Even in the age of social media, we rely on journalists to find and tell the stories of people stuck in extreme circumstances. One of the best of a new generation of journalists joins us now. She's Sula Mae Anderson, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is a show that celebrates the stories and storytellers shaping public life. This week we're joined by a remarkable and courageous journalist whose work often depicts the lives of people confronting extreme situations. Sula Mae Anderson's work can be seen regularly in The Atlantic, Esquire, Harper's, and Foreign Policy, among many others. Suleme, thank you so much for being with us. Hi, thank you for having me. So you've reported from some of the world's most dangerous places about people living in really sort of confronting extreme circumstances. What leads you to these stories? What gets you out of the safety of the newsroom, as it were, and into the places where you find these stories? Well, it's funny because I've never really been the kind of person who feels at home in a newsroom. Um, I like to say I get a really large percentage of my stories just from talking to people wherever I go. Um, so uh, I like to say that I collect strange stories and strange people. Um, so if I'm based, um, for example, I've been based in Beirut for on and off for the past seven years, um, and I just find myself, you know, talking to as many people as possible. Um, when I hear about something that interests me, I follow up on it. Um, and I just try to be as curious and open as possible. Do you find, so when you, when you, when you find these people living, so you've done you've extensive reporting about people living under the ISIS yoke. When you find people, are they, are they how comfortable are they you know, opening up to you about, about this experience? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, journalism is a really interesting, tricky thing because um, from my perspective, these people have absolutely no reason to talk to us, you know, right. and most of the time they have every reason not to talk to us. Um, and I know journalists who um, tend to take that for granted a little bit, um, and I dislike the attitude um, that I see sometimes and less and less now, I feel like, but, um, but this sort of attitude like, okay, so what's your story? Give me your story. Okay, let's go. Never mind, you know, and then I got the quote and that's it. Um, and I find that to be an interesting approach because A, I don't think that it actually works that well necessarily, um, but B, I think it, it doesn't really, um, I, I'm much more grateful than that for the, for the confidence that these people are placing in me and, and, and sharing their stories with someone who they don't know, who has, you know, in, in many ways, every opportunity to make their life more difficult. Well, and, and is there some risk in the fact that they're telling these stories to you? It depends on the piece that I'm working on and what the topic is, but yes, in, in almost every circumstance, it's it's more of, of, um, of, a, of a, a challenge or more of a, um, a, a sacrifice for them, obviously, mm -hmm. than it is for me. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, they don't necessarily trust someone they just met, um, and it's it, I consider it my job and my duty to, um, to Make them more comfortable, and then also feel like I am um, I'm honoring their their choice to trust me. So we're going to get into some specific stories a little later on, but in general, how do you earn that trust? How do you find these people? I mean, I'm assuming you don't just show up on their doorstep. These these are not people in the news. These are not prominent people or visible people who, and they're not people who probably have ever told their stories to a journalist. How do you how do you work that, especially under such extenuating circumstances? I mean, I think, uh, like, when I start reporting a story, I start thinking about access, right? And um, when it comes to stories where victims play a large role, um, you know, I tend to go through organizations or um, NGOs that have contacts within these communities that, um, that you know, um, that they're comfortable with, that they trust. Um, 
And so that's one way of, of getting an in into a situation like that. Um, and then sometimes you just show up and start asking questions and, and hope that they that they decide to answer them. Um, I think some of it is like just the ability to to create an empathetic bond with someone to um, to be honest and, 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 and sincere in the way you address them and, and you communicate with them. Um, and then some of it is just, you know, you can just you learn as you as you uh, gain experience. And, and you speak other languages besides English. What, what do you what are you fluent in or speak or? I am almost fluent in Arabic. I wouldn't say completely, but I can get by and I can communicate. So, so that's also useful to you. Yes, very. <laughs> so you've made a conscious decision in your career with with this amazing work to do less of the politics of, of extremism and conflict and war and more the human beings, the people. Why make that choice? I mean, both are very valid forms of reporting about our world today, but you've gone in the story of people direction. Why? Definitely. Um, I think, you know, it's funny because lately I was, I was thinking about that and I was like, I've been doing more of the kind of like just um, <sighs> political, um, Obviously, it's still people. I mean, the people involved in these situations are all human beings. So, uh, but I was thinking recently that I was like, I need to return to more of the the kind of stories that I went into this business to do, um, which I have still been doing. But um, I think the reason I prefer to focus more on that than just, for example, um, you know, uh, just bang bang sort of war reporting or um, or even you know more about about the political. Um, scenarios and, and, and those types of things than the human beings. The reason I prefer to f focus on the human beings is because they are so often lost in the narrative. Um, you know, we in America, we only get a certain amount of exposure to foreign news to begin with, the average American, I would say. Um, and in that time, you know, they can hear about, um, you know, political parties and movements and, 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 and maybe even battles and, 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 you know, things like that. The, the chances of them engaging with that information are like pretty slim, you know. Um, so for me, I find that when I focus on the human beings who are actually affected by these scenarios and, and these um, sort of larger political games, um, I find that I get more of a result actually from from the readership. And I've noticed that I consider it my my um, mission or my job, you know, to to make people in America just for a moment, doesn't have to last very long, but just for them to look at the life of someone across the world who they seemingly have nothing in common with and think, oh wow, if I were in that situation, how would I feel, how would I react? Um, you know, how would, I want them to imagine that person as a human being, um, and I consider that what I try to do with my writing. It's a mission of empathy. Yes. Yeah. And a noble mission, yeah. too. It's yeah. a very important one. Well, one of the really, um, there's so much of your writing that I just am really uh, uh, taken with, but there was one story in particular, uh, a little bit more than a year old, where you interviewed some uh, women survivors of uh, the ISIS occupation uh, in, in Iraq, uh, the Yazidi in particular. Um, how did you find that story? And, and just uh, if you could tell us, talk us through the reporting of that story. Yeah, well, um, I was in Iraq, and I it, it started out actually as a piece. Um, I had the opportunity to interview captured ISIS members, and um, it was just starting that reporters were starting to get access through the KRG to these um, prisoners. And I thought, well, what would I want to interview one of them about? If you know, having this opportunity. You know, I could interview them about, you know, I don't know, some 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 uh, sort of conflicty type topic. I could interview them about, you know, all sorts of things. But I said, no, I really want to know about the women because um, there were, had been some reporting uh, at that point on uh, on the experiences of these Yazidi women who had been enslaved by ISIS and um, and how. I remember one piece in particular in the New York Times just had me absolutely wrecked after I read it, and I thought. You know, I want to see, I want to talk to them about how they can allow that to happen, how they can participate in it, and what kind of person um, gets, and how someone gets to the point where they justify that kind of treatment of another human being. Um, so, so that I built from there. Um, and I did, and then, you know, it started out from the opportunity to interview the prisoners and then I started interviewing the women and to me that became much more of 
you know, as, as interesting and unique as the opportunity to interview a captured ISIS member is, I didn't want it to be just about them. One of the, one of the things that you wrote in that story, though, was that, the, that ISIS had uh, developed a process, you said, yes. to dehumanize their victims. Yes. What is that process? Well, I mean, the, the process that, you know, they have a very, very intense, um, obviously brainwashy ideology that, um, you know, as many other radical groups do, but in particular there is an ex a very extreme version of, um, of radical ideology. And part of that ideology um, is that Yazidis are devil worshippers, um, that because of their, they're actually, they're a fascinating culture in and mm -hmm. of themselves and, um, and, and one that is needs to be um, you know people should read up on because it, it's very interesting um, they have had um, a very dark history of persecution because of their religious beliefs and um, so it starts from there it starts from the fact that you know they're Satan worshippers they don't they're not human they it's not like um, well you know as far as they're concerned Muslim uh, Sunni Muslim women are, are, are quote-unquote human but like even that you know those women are treated they're, they're, they don't think of women as human mm -hmm. to begin with, and I think that's part of the process. And then you layer on the further dehumanization yes. of a religious sect that you, you consider satanic, and it, it flows from there. Yes. So during and after the reporting of that, talk about you as a person and as a woman. I mean, you were hearing horrible, horrific things, the, the worst kind of, of human behavior almost imaginable. Yeah. How did that affect you? emotionally and, and spiritually and any other way? Um, that was definitely one of the hardest, um, if not the most difficult you know, group of interviews that I've done. Um, it's, it's funny because, um, I mean, I know, I know journalists who consider it kind of a badge of honor to, to detach emotionally from this work. I personally do not. Um, I think um, I don't. I focus my attention on not um, on not crying in front of them because I find that disrespectful because it's not my life. You know what I mean? I didn't go anything mm. like through anything like that, so I don't feel like it's my place to sit there and cry in their homes. But uh, but it is very difficult um, to hear those things and maintain composure. Um, and yeah, it, it was very hard. And then by the time I got to the to one of the interviews of the prisoners, I had already interviewed the women, and I was very angry. And, um, and that kind of informed my interview of him, which was... Um, well, there's, there's, there's sort of, in, in the way you write about it, there's, a, you, there's sort of a defiance. Like, you, yeah. you're, you're aware that he's going to be uh, uh, shocked by the fact that you're not covered, right? Yeah. Uh, and you, you almost, you almost uh, play is not the right word, but you're, 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 you're sort of assertive in your confidence. Yeah. Well, because um, you know, for for him, I knew the ultimate humiliation was to be um, interviewed by an American woman, unveiled, um, who is unafraid of him. For for someone who has been living in that ideology and um, and believes it, I knew that that would be the ultimate insult. And frankly, I was I was angry on a personal level, and 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 that you know sort of triggered it. But then I realized that it also, I it. it informed his responses um, and I, I, I wasn't like aggressive about it I didn't go you know it d didn't do anything I think overly aggressive with him I just I just sort of noticed his reactions to my um, to the questions I was asking to the way I was asking them to the fact that I was not afraid of him um, and you know that's kind of how, just how you you read an interview subjects reaction to you and, and it's part of the process of knowing how to um, craft your interview. We're going to take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. We're broadcast three times every weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's popular Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS Channel 124. Story in the Public Square is produced by a tremendously talented team at the studios of Rhode Island PBS in beautiful Providence, Rhode Island. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. If you want to connect with me on Twitter, I'm at J. M. Lutis. To my right is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller. He's an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal and author of 17 books. 
Wayne's on Twitter too, at G Wayne Miller, all one word. And our guest this week is Suleme Anderson, a journalist who's worked all over the world to bring her readers stories about people confronting the most extreme circumstances. She's on Twitter too, at Suleme Anderson. So I wonder if you can talk to us too about um, the kind of preparation that you might have received the first time you went into a war zone. Uh, we've heard from journalists you know, over the last 15 years that uh, there's sort of a, a, a steep learning curve. Some news organizations are better than others about helping folks get ready. I'm curious what kind of experience you had uh, the first time you went into, into harm's way. It's funny because, um, so I was raised by, by you know, war journalists essentially um, and we were discussing before the show that um, that I, I kind of went in the opposite direction and tried very hard not to get into journalism for a long time and then realized that you know it was what I was supposed to be doing and then you know went into the same business that my parents did but having had my childhood I also saw what conflict um, severe uh, exposure to conflict does to people emotionally, psychologically. Um, it's something that I witnessed my entire life, um, not just from my father and my mother, but also you know, from their friends um, and their colleagues. So I was very aware, even when I started going into conflict journalism, I purposefully stayed away from um, combat journalism for a couple of years at least. Longer you know, than I think most people sort of show up and just want to jump right in, and I didn't have that attitude. Um, and it wasn't because I, you know, I, I know myself well enough and I knew that I, it's not about like the fear necessarily, maybe it should be, but it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was more about like being, um, I really was afraid of seeing people die uh, in front of me. I, I was afraid of what that would do to me psychologically um, because I'd seen what it had done to other people in my life. Um, so that was my main concern leading up to it. Um, I remember asking my father, like when it just comes down to the actual like danger of it, I asked my dad when I was playing around with, you know, whether I should go to Iraq or whether I should try going to Syria or doing one of these um, more um, severe combat situations. And um, I asked my dad, I was like, Dad, you know, um, how will I know if I can handle it? Like, you know, being under a fire, what do I do? And I'll just like blank out the expletives here. <laughs> my, dad said, my dad said, you know, so my, uh, there are three kinds of people, you know, the kind that expletive themselves and run, the kind that expletive themselves and stay, and the kind that expletive themselves stay and then come back. And um, you'll figure out real quick which one you are. Wow. And, um, and he was right. <laughs> So you're an author as well, and this is a perfect time to get into your first book, uh, The Hostage's Daughter. Uh, it won a nonfiction book award, two international book awards, and has been optioned for film. Tell us about the book and a little bit more about your father. Some of our audience may not know who your father is, although I suspect most of them would. Talk about the book and, and your dad. So my dad is Terry Anderson. Um, he was the Middle East Bureau Chief of the Associated Press um, in the 1980s. And um, he was, three months before I was born, in March of 1985, I was born in June, um, he was kidnapped by a, a Shia militant group called the Islamic Jihad, which would eventually become associated with Hezbollah. And, um, and he was held for six and a half years. Uh, and the book is uh, mostly investigation of his kidnapping. Um, about 30% memoir of, of his, the effect his kidnapping had on my life and how it shaped my, um, my understanding of the world. And, but it's mostly um, you know, me trying to get close to the people who kidnapped him. What, was there a cathartic or emotional benefit to, to writing that book? Was it difficult? I mean, oh, talk yeah. about that. I mean, I, I, it must have been. Yeah. The, um, this, I mean, you, your first seven years of your life, dad is alive, we think, and not in good circumstances if he is alive. Yeah, it was, it was a very strange um, way to grow up and, uh, and, and difficult one and not as difficult as some, but, but difficult enough, I think. And, um, and the book itself, um, I didn't, when I started out in journalism, I didn't write about, you know, my, my personal story at all, really. Um, I, you know, tried not to, in fact. I wasn't ready to go there, number one. Number two, I didn't really want it. I wanted to be, um, you know, known for my own journalistic merits as well, so I, I 
you know, my first editors who published me had no idea, you know, who my dad was or anything like that. Which, um, but, but when I um, in, in about I think it was like fall of 2013, several things happened to me um, that made me decide to start writing this book. One of them was that my friend um, was kidnapped by ISIS and um, Peter Kasich, and it was right around the time that I started um, thinking, you know, that that, that, that I needed to um, to write about it because it was in the you know it was going to be it was in the news a lot with James Foley and all, mm -hmm. all those things. Kidnappings of journalists were again in the news, um, and I was at a point where I could start to process it. So I said, you know, how am I going to go about this? I don't want this to be a memoir like you know, poor me in my life. How do I do this in a way that also um, you know it does justice to my experience and my passion for reporting? So I thought, you know, the best way to do this is to report on what happened. Um, and I thought, you know, when I started out reporting, I said my holy grail, you know, when I do this is that I meet one of the men who kidnapped my father. And I made that my mission for three years. And, um, and, and yeah, I think um, it was just... And you met him? Yes, I did, I did. What I, was uh, that like? It was um, strange, very strange. And I mean, you know, I, I don't want to give away too much, but the way in which I met this man, the kind of coincidental nature of our meeting and our, our you know, our, our dialogue, how it developed was, um, it's, it's still, sometimes I'm like, I, can't, I couldn't have made that up, you know, that it happened that way, wow. but yeah. It's, oh, okay. in, it's interesting because so you, your own personal narrative is, is wrapped up with sort of the, the, the interplay of reporting and, and conflict uh, and you've done and, and, and what that does to families in, in the aftermath. But you're, some of your reporting is focused too on what happens to people who have been stuck and caught, in, caught up in these, in these cataclysms and what happens to them when they escape to the new world as it were, right, yeah. and, and, and try to resettle in the West. Uh, tell us a little bit about those stories. Um, oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I love talking about those stories because I think right now is a really important time to be um, to be considering the backgrounds of people, f you know, fleeing war, um, the attitudes that we have in America right now towards refugees. Um, I, I did a piece for the Village Voice um, earlier this year, I think in May, about asylum seekers who had, um, you know, who have. Flee, who are fleeing, you know, extremely dangerous scenarios, um, abuse, um, you know, extreme trauma. Um, you know, they are they are refugees, um, and 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 they, you know, having been in conflict situations and seeing the situations these people are fleeing and the circumstances, I think um, something that really frustrates me with the dialogue around refugees is this entirely, you know, it comes from a place of just ignorance and lack of exposure mm -hmm. to this, to the, um, to the extremity of the situations that these people are fleeing. Um, but it is frustrating to see that lack of empathy when you know how, um, you know, how awful it is living in, the, in those places, how, how, um, how brave it is to leave and, and want to start a new life, and, and how, you know, tragic it is that, that, that they're being received with such, um, with such a lack of empathy. Why do you think there is that lack of empathy? I mean, you have a unique perspective on the lives of these people, as you said, they're, they're coming from horrible circumstances. It's incredibly courageous to try to get here, and to get here, and particularly in this climate, and, and to try to stay here. I mean, That's right. Why the lack of empathy? I mean, it just seems to me, based on common human decency, would your heart would go out to these people, no matter how hard your heart might be politically. Well, I mean, I think some of it, it, it from you know, people tend to not really. Um, understand what they haven't been exposed to. So for someone in America, I mean, there are a variety of different ways that one can struggle in America, right? But it doesn't involve barrel bombs and, um, and you know, the kind of mm -hmm. um, struggles that you would have in a conflict zone. Or waking up in the morning and thinking you could be blown away and your family dead by nightfall. Exactly. We do not have that. We have waged wars overseas for many years now. Um, and as a result, Americans have forgotten, I think, the true cost of war because it has not happened on their soil, thank God. Um, and I mean, you know, obviously the attacks of September 11th and things like that, uh, but that's very different, you know, than, than, than a you know, full-time living in a conflict zone. So I think part of it is just that there's just no um, frame of reference for mm -hmm. it. Um, and it becomes very easy for people to, um, to just think that, that 
you know, their this their baseline is everyone's baseline. It's not like that. Um, and and you know, I mean, I think some of it is is just an a natural ability to empathize or not empathize. Um, Either you have it or you don't. Exactly. And yeah. then some of it is, you know, conditioning and all that. I think what's really important if, you know, to reach, I find the only way to reach people who have, do not have that kind of empathetic, um, you know, sort of ability to begin with to refugees and people who aren't like them is to look at the facts and the statistics say that these people are not a threat, that yeah. they are, um, that they are a, a benefit to any country that they, that, you know, overall, um, the benefits of immigration and, 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 and things like that have been well documented by, through statistics. Um, so if you don't have that innate empath ability to empathize with people in those circumstances who are suffering and who just want to make a better life for themselves, that's fine, but you should really look at the numbers. Is there something too though about the way the kinds of stories that you cover are reported now by the big American media outlets. So, you know, once upon a time, uh, 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 there was an army of uh, foreign correspondents working for the big American outlets, and they were scattered all over the world uh, and living in sort of long persistence in, in, in places and really getting to know people, and their reporting captured that. That doesn't seem quite as prevalent today. Uh, with, there are exceptions, of course, but it doesn't seem quite as pervasive. And, and you know, the, the, the think about uh, folks from the Providence Journal who embedded 15 years ago in war zones. Michael Corkery, for right. example. You know, that just seems to be not where newspapers and a lot of the media is, is headed these days. Is that a fair criticism? 100%. Um, I think, I think what I would say about that is that. Um, it's not that there is a lack of will or um, talent or um, or drive to document these stories on the on the part of journalists. There are still incredibly talented um, journalists doing amazing work all over you know the world and especially from conflict zones. However, when you look at the industry itself, I recently had an essay for Stratfor, um, the intelligence firm, about this situation about the decline of foreign correspondence in the Middle East and what and, and around, around the world and what that means. Um, and I was surprised because I expected more journalists to like and share the piece. And I think the reason that it, you know, people don't really want to acknowledge that, that where we're at right now um, in this industry is a very different place than where we used to be. It's, we don't, there's no reason to point fingers, you know, or blame people. A lot of it, there is no one to blame. The internet was a huge part of this shift. Um, you know, we, and in the 80s, um, uh, this type of journalism relied on uh, profit from print advertising, which was much more lucrative. You know, there's a lot of reasons that go into why the industry has changed, but the point is it has changed. We gotta leave it there. Suleiman Anderson, the book is The Hostage's Daughter. It's a wonderful book. Thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week, but if you wanna know more about storing the public square, please visit us at PellCenter.org. He's Wayne, I'm Jim. We look forward to joining you next week for more Story in the Public Square.